Welcome aboard. My name is Peter Thomas, and I'm your volunteer boat captain today. We're going to take about a 40-minute trip down the headwaters of the Gordon River, proceed up the Golden Gate Canal, and return. During this trip, we're going to learn some things about the importance of the ecosystems that exist here in southwest Florida, something about the flora and fauna and the delicate balance of nature. The Conservancy was founded in 1964 to fight the construction of a road through Rookery Bay, the road to nowhere, and to preserve and protect the natural environment. In 1978, we acquired this site, which is called the Naples Nature Center. We are in a man-made lagoon that was developed by the previous landowner who was a citrus plantation owner. This lagoon was dug to provide a means to take his citrus crop to market down the Gordon River to Naples Bay and thence to market. One of the things we're going to learn today is the importance of the mangrove trees to the environment. You see them on the right and left of you as we enter the Gordon River. There are over 40 species of mangrove trees in the world. We have three here in Southwest Florida, the red mangrove, which you see on either side of the boat and which you can identify by their prop roots. The black mangrove tree, which generally grows in behind the red, and the white mangrove tree, which grows in behind the black because it is the least salt tolerant. We are now in a tidal river known as an estuary, a mixture of salt water from the Gulf and fresh water from upland rivers and canals. It is brackish water. We get an average two and a half feet of tide here, and the water ranges in depth from four to seven feet. Mangrove trees survive in salt or brackish water and are practically the only trees to do so. They can live in fresh water, but other plants are more aggressive. As we make this bend to the left, you will see some palms. These are sable palms, which are commonly called cabbage palms. It is the state tree for Florida. The leaf producing bud of this palm is harvested as an edible delicacy, originally known as swamp cabbage, and which you may know as hearts of palm. Harvesting this bud kills the tree. In the early days of Florida, picnickers would go to the riverside with a fishing pole, a frying pan, and an ax. Lunch would be fried fish and swamp cabbage salad. The current canned variety of hearts of palm is now usually imported from South America. Palms are not trees. They are related to the cactus and grass families. Mangrove trees do not survive well in cold temperatures and are not frost tolerant. Thus, they are only found in tropical or subtropical environments, generally between latitudes 27 degrees north and 27 degrees south. As we continue down the river, keep in mind the three multi-storied levels of the mangrove tree, the roots, the understory, and the canopy. Each plays an important part in the environmental scheme of things. You will notice some interesting tropical plantings on this property to the right. The tall palms are coconut palms, not considered to be native to Florida, but are naturalized since they have been here for centuries. They came to Florida probably by way of a hurricane that brought them here from Cuba. Most of the earlier coconut palms, Jamaica tall, were destroyed by lethal yellowing and have been replaced by the Malayan dwarf. The coconut is one of the largest plant seeds in the world, and the meat, called copra, is converted to cooking oil, margarine, and soap. Note the concrete seawall. This type of bank protection is no longer preferred. Rather, if you look to the property across the channel, you see a form of rocks protecting the bank. It is called riprap. It is used because it is more environmentally friendly. 
It more closely emulates the habitat provided by the mangrove tree roots that you see on the left. You may say that they don't look anything alike, but in fact, the riprap provides nooks and crannies as a habitat for the invertebrates, crustaceans, shrimp, crayfish, clams, and so forth, much like the prop roots of the red mangrove trees do. And that is one of the foremost reasons for protecting the mangrove trees, the environment they provide for the smallest of life's creatures. Microscopic plankton are flushed into the roots and provide the first link in the food chain. And these are eaten by the invertebrates, small crabs, shrimp, and other crustaceans that become food for small fish. Small fish are food for large fish, and large fish are food for humans. And so goes the food chain, an important environmental cycle. Scientists estimate that 97% of all marine life depends on the mangrove ecosystem for survival. Earlier I spoke of the three parts of the mangrove trees that are important. The roots are the most important. But the understory also provides an important habitat for birds. We may see a small greenback heron sitting on a branch waiting for an unsuspecting fish to swim by. This fish will become the heron's meal, another aspect of the food chain. The understory also provides a nesting area for birds. Yellow-crowned night herons and tri-colored herons use our mangrove trees for their nest each spring. We may see them on some islands farther along our trip, usually only in late spring. Tri-colored herons also use the mangrove understory for their nest each spring. Above the understory, the canopy serves as a rookery for many wading birds and offers protection from many predators. Because the mangrove trees are so important to our natural environment, they are protected by law in Florida. It is illegal to cut them down or trim them without permission from the state. The rules are complicated, but needless to say, the general rule is you may not trim the mangrove trees. A number of years ago, a developer cut down a bunch of trees. The conservancy took him to court. He was fined a substantial amount of money for each tree he cut, and he cut hundreds. And in settlement of the case, the developer agreed to replant the area with white mangrove and some buttonwood trees, which you see to the left. Momentarily, you will see on your left two islands made of mangrove trees. These islands probably started as a single property from the red mangrove and expanded as the sand and silt from the tide built up the roots and prop roots of the trees. The Indians called the red mangrove tree the island tree for obvious reasons, and others called the tree the walking tree. Do the prop roots look like the legs of a centipede? I can also tell you that these islands are probably in the range of 50 years of age or more, and their roosts and canopy provide a nesting area in the spring for yellow-crowned night herons and tricolored herons. We have now reached the confluence of the Gordon River and the Golden Gate Canal. If we turned right, we would go down the river to Naples Bay by Tin City. However, we're going to make a left turn and go up the canal to see additional aspects of our ecosystem. The development on the right is called River Reach, a private development with its own boat launch. You will again note the riprap system of river bank protection. Notice the yellow crowned night heron with his favorite food, a crab. Let's talk about conservation for a moment. Notice the dramatic difference between the right bank and left bank of the canal. Which one do you prefer? Obviously, it is the left bank. The right bank looks sterile for providing any food or protection for the small marine life. If the developers have their way, they would disturb these wetlands and interfere with the normal course of the food chain. A number of years ago, both sides of this canal looked the same until 
a developer made a deal with government officials that if he could remove the undesirable trees, he could remove the mangrove trees. The agreement provided that mangrove tree seedlings would be planted along the high tide line of the bank, which you may see with a closer look. Maybe in 20 or 30 years, we will have some mature mangrove trees along the bank. Notice also that the developer, to his credit, installed riprap. The riprap is home to many marine creatures. Others use our waterways for pleasure. I would like to tell you a little bit about the importance of water to our environment. Virtually everything that humans do requires water in one form or another. The major use for fresh water on this planet is irrigation. Some 70% of the water is used to irrigate the world's cropland that represents 18% of the world's land area. 75% of irrigation water never reaches the crop but is lost to evaporation or seepage. Per capita water consumption in Western Europe is 50 gallons per person per day. In the US, it is 100 gallons. And in South Florida, it is over 150 gallons per day. The single largest source of water pollution in the United States is agriculture, 67%. And it is about 85% in Collier County. Change in water quantity and quality can be dramatic. A one inch rainfall in one square mile provides 17 million gallons of water. East of here, there is a development called Golden Gate Estates with 60 square miles of homes, buildings, roads, streets, driveways, parking lots, and so forth. A one inch rainfall there provides almost one billion gallons of water much of which flows into this canal and into Naples Bay. This dramatically changes the salinity of this canal and Naples Bay and the balance of the ecosystems. While adult fish can adjust to some changes, major ones affect juvenile fish. Also, the water is not recycled into our area's aquifers. On your right, you see the Coconut River, a short river, three quarters of a mile long, probably fed by springs. The tall trees you see on both the right and left are Australian pines. There's an osprey eating a fish. There's a family of Muscovy ducks. They were brought to Florida as shade trees and wind barriers. It is not a true pine tree, but a hardwood. The seed capsules are not true cones, and the needles are, in fact, compressed leaves. It has no taproot, but only shallow lateral root systems. It is, therefore, susceptible to falling down in strong winds. Further, the loggerhead turtles cannot easily traverse these lateral roots where these trees are common along sandy beaches. You may recall that I said that red mangrove trees do not compete well as do other plant systems in fresher water. Thus, you will note that along the canal bank, there are fewer mangrove trees here than where we came from, where the water is more brackish. On my left, behind the canal bank, is a burrow for the gopher tortoise. As you know, tortoises are land turtles and usually don't swim in water. The large ferns you see on the left are leather ferns the largest fern in North America. They've been around a long time. And in case you have not already done so, I recommend that you visit Corkscrew Sanctuary on the road to Immokalee. It has a fantastic display of native ferns, plants, animals, and birds. Ahead of us, you see bridge traffic on Airport Road. Between us is a small dam called a weir for water control purposes. As we make our turn, you will see a large grouping of Brazilian pepper trees. In the winter and spring, they are covered with red berries. The tree is native to Brazil and is sometimes called the Florida holly, but it is not a holly. It is known as an invasive exotic, a grouping of plants and trees which are considered to be invasive to native plant systems. That is, they squeeze out plants and prevent their growth. 
This tree is very aggressive. Birds love the berries, which can germinate after passing through the bird's digestive system. The tree is also toxic to some people who can get a rash after pruning the tree, a rash similar to poison ivy. Birds can get tipsy from the fermenting berries, especially robins from the north. Let's talk about manatees. You have seen signs for no wake manatee area. Yes, this is indeed an area where we can see manatees from time to time. That is because manatees, which are a mammal of ancient origin, seek warm water in the wintertime. And this canal and the Gordon River are warmer than the Gulf waters in winter. They do not survive well in waters below 68 degrees Fahrenheit, and indeed go into hypothermia in waters below 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Manatees have no natural enemies. They are vegetarians eating grasses and plants up to 10% of their body weight each day. They can grow to 3,000 pounds and up to 16 feet in length and are found in the waters of South Florida and the Caribbean. Fish that can tolerate brackish water are found in this canal and the rivers. Mullet, redfish, sheep's head, amberjack, snapper, tarpon, and gar. Freshwater fish like big mouth bass are known to be here. Along the banks, you will see cattails. The common cattail is a native opportunistic North American wetland species. Cattails can be found in damp soil or shallow water where sufficient nutrients are available. Cattail seeds prefer fresh water. Cattails can quickly dominate a wetland plant community and reduce the overall habitat value. The tuber of this plant was used by the Indians to make a potato-like food, and the leaf itself was used to make baskets, clothing, and other useful items. We do see alligators from time to time. The American alligator is one of two species in the world. They like fresh water. Alligators are cold-blooded reptiles. That is, their body takes on the temperature of the environment around them. They are from a different family of reptiles than crocodiles which can be identified by their more pointed snouts and the protrusion of their fourth tooth over their lip. We see turtles of several species. The soft shell can be identified by the flat round shell on its back. There are snakes in this area, but there are no venomous tree snakes in Florida, so we don't have to worry about a snake falling into our boat. Here we have the great blue heron. Epiphytes are an interesting tropical plant. As we pass by the island on the right, you can see a bunch of these attached to the mangrove tree branches. Epiphytes are known as air plants because they attach themselves to other plants and trees as their host, yet they receive no nourishment from the host. Food and water come from the air. Rain collects in the basal rosettes of the plant as well as leaves and other decay. You may know some air plants as bromeliads. Many have beautiful flowers. Thousands of species exist, including orchids. Let's talk about the mangrove trees again. Each of the Florida species has its own way of removing the salt from the brackish water it lives in. The red mangrove tree excludes the salt from entering the roots and therefore is called an excluder type of mangrove tree. The black mangrove tree, which grows in behind the red, excretes the salt from the back of its leaf. The white mangrove tree excretes the salt in a manner we're not sure about. Thus, the black and white mangroves are known as salt excretors. In low water, you can see the pneumatophores of the black mangrove tree. These are part of the root system and are the tree's way of obtaining needed oxygen, just as the prop roots do the same thing for the red mangrove tree. White mangrove trees may also produce some pneumatophores, but they are not nearly so numerous. As we enter this open space, take a look on the left at the very large staghorn epiphyte on the tree trunk. The larger giant vine on the left on the Australian pine is a giant pothos vine, part of the philodendron family. 
Notice the variety of tropical plants on the property in front of us. The vine wrapped around the coconut palms is night blooming cereus, which makes a wonderful fragrance in the early morning with its flower. See the mango tree, sago palm, and citrus trees? We have other examples of the mango tree at the entrance to the conservancy. The sago palm, it's not a palm at all, but a cycad, one of the oldest plant groups. A citrus tree, <laughs> lots of vitamin C. The mangrove tree requires flushing water that is provided by the tides. This recycles valuable nutrients for the trees as well as the underwater animals. One acre of red mangrove trees will provide three tons of litter that decays as food for the food chain. You may notice how brown the water is. Tannic acid from decaying leaves dyes the river water brown, much like tea leaves do to water. Actually, the water of this river is of good quality, not potable, but not highly polluted. Flushing helps to keep it that way. Well, we're coming to the end of our trip. Just a few words about the Conservancy. It's a private, non-profit organization dedicated to preserving and protecting the natural biodiversity in Southwest Florida and its native environments. To that end, it has a variety of programs and activities to support that mission. Here on the grounds, we have an excellent natural history museum home to great exhibits about our local environment. The museum also houses our aquaria, featuring local marine life, including a loggerhead sea turtle. The Wildlife Rehabilitation Center is our animal hospital, where injured native species are treated and hopefully released back into the wild. Also on the grounds are beautiful nature trails featuring native plants and animals. During winter, the Conservancy offers free beach walks, both on Marco Island and in Naples. Volunteer beach walkers lead these trips starting at 8.30 a.m. Monday through Friday. If you want to know more about the local beaches and their wildlife, this is the trip for you. Please ask at the front desk for more information about upcoming Conservancy activities. There are also opportunities for you to volunteer if you spend some time in the Naples area. If you enjoyed this trip and thought it has been worthwhile, you have a way of further showing your appreciation with the donation to the Conservancy. It is through the generosity of our boat passengers that we're able to maintain, even improve, these boat trips. We have a donation box located on the dock as you leave. Your donation will help keep our batteries charged. We enjoyed having you with us today. Thank you.